Okay, good morning. This is uh, Radio Free Flint, Arthur Bush speaking. We have a, a really good show today. We have Avon Burns, who's uh, a retired professor and coordinator of the criminal justice program at Mock Community College, and she's going to talk to us. Uh, this is a lady that's the, the, maybe not the mother of all the police that you see out there and the police leaders, but she certainly contributed to their careers here in uh, the Flint area and further out. So uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, her uh, her pre her uh, biography a little bit and uh, her accomplishments at Mock Community College, which in my mind uh, are un uh, in my mind at least they're uh, things which our community needs to to understand and copy in other areas of uh, a life of excellence because Avon Burns represents the best that Flint, Michigan can produce. Now with that great introduction, Avon, uh, tell us all about yourself. Good morning, Arthur, and that was a great and much appreciated introduction. A little bit about myself, I'm a uh, Flintstone, born in the old St. Joe, and named after Avon Street in Flint. Wow. I didn't, you didn't know that. I didn't know that. That is, uh, mm -hmm. that is something new. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, Avon, you uh, are a native of Flint and uh, you, um, holy smokes, every time I try something new here, I have a problem. Isn't that something? Uh, uh, but anyway, let's go on with the interview. You, um, Avon, were born and raised in Flint, and what what schools did you attend? I attended the old Clark School, Stewart for one year, Whittier, and Southwestern High. Yeah. And um, what year did you graduate? Center, what year did you graduate, Southwestern? Graduated from Southwestern in 1970, but I wanted to share a Southwestern story uh, with you and your listeners that uh, prompted me to re really give consideration to some of the stair steps that I've uh, benefited from throughout my life and career. At Southwestern in the Southwestern Orchestra, I was last chair, second violin, and and the conductor, Dr. Ray Roth, called me in the office and offered me a scholarship to, a summer scholarship to Interlochen Arts Academy in Interlochen, Michigan. And the reason he offered the scholarship is because he said he needed a section leader for his second violins for the next school year. So Interlochen was um, an extraordinary experience and not an easy one. It was um, culturally very challenging, but I went and I endured and indeed became the sec section leader of the second violins the following year and thereafter, and we were an award-winning orchestra. So that story stands out in my mind because this is a man, Dr. Roth, that obviously saw hidden potential in me that he wanted to unleash, and, and I'm grateful for that experience. Well, he was a, a man that uh, had a quest for excellence. And, mm -hmm. and uh, when I look at your career in course, I have to have full disclosure here. You were my boss for probably close to 18 years at the end of my time at Mott College. I spent 35 years there. But uh, one thing, if anybody asked me to describe you, it was that you expected excellence and most of the time you got it. And I, I, well, wonder, I wonder what it is in you that made, made that uh, obviously, um, um, Mr. Roth was was uh, was quite a guy, and but what else was it about your upbringing in Flint that you know gave you that uh, 
that attribute? Well, my generation in Flint was truly uh, blessed. Um, growing up in Flint, you could not have asked for a more enriching childhood. Um, I, I clearly remember as an example in the uh, community park, we had a, a certified teacher that ran uh, programming in the park every day. So parents were able to send their children to the park where they could play freely and safely, engage in um, extracurricular activities all under the supervision of a certified teacher. To me, that was amazing. Community Ed in Flint was well and alive during my childhood where the uh, neighborhood schools offered all sorts of activities, roller skating, scouting, um, and others. Right. And so the Flint community at the time that I grew up was a very enriching, supportive community, particularly for children. The downtown was vibrant with um, three movie the theaters. In fact, I worked at the uh, Capitol Theater as a concession attendant. That must have been in the middle 60s. Wow. And now, so the now, community was just loaded with opportunity for children. Yeah. Now, Avon, eventually uh, after you graduated, well, actually probably pretty quickly after you graduated from Southwestern High School, you went on to college. Went up to Ferris State. Um, it was a college then, as you know, it's now a university, and I want to share a story from Ferris State that you probably, I know you're not aware of. <laughs> My roommates and I had the uh, creative idea of moving a piece of furniture from the lobby up to our room to enhance our dorm room, and there were three others involved in this escapade, but only I was chosen for uh to be singled out for punishment. And at that time, we had a number of Vietnam vets up at Ferris, older older guys that kind of looked out for us. And the one gentleman that um, intervened in this situation eventually became a college president. But of course, at that time, in the early 70s, I had no idea that his journey was taking there. but. He uh, met with the dorm mother, and they worked out a deal where I would serve on um, the student disciplinary committee as my punishment. And I ended up becoming uh, chief justice <laughs> of the student disciplinary committee. So once again, you know, my steps were somewhat ordered, and no doubt that was probably my first introduction to um, non-traditional criminal justice. So Avon, from there, you, you uh, I assume you graduated from Ferris? Yeah, but not before I completed a, an internship at the Legal Liaison and Rehabilitation Center where we managed the Pres Prosecutor Leonard's Drug Diversionary Program, which took me into the jail to interview uh, inmates and upon graduation, landed me a position with Odyssey uh, program in New York City. Odyssey, which is a which is sort of a famous, it is a famous drug yeah. rehab uh, program. And I think at one point we had uh, a program in Flint called Odyssey House. Do you remember that? Yeah, we still do. But uh, I was fortunate to be hired by the founder of Odyssey, Dr. Judy Ann Denson Gerber. And so I uh, feel that hiring was somewhat significant. But I returned to Flint from New York to take a position with the Flint's former city manager, Daniel Bogan. You remember him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He created a position called government intern, and he took 10 college graduates 
and assign them to various aspects of city government for the purpose of grooming them for uh, managerial positions. And he, he assigned me to the Flint Police Department, and I quote, to utilize me as a desensitizing agent. And this was before Flint Police hired its first female police officers. So that too was somewhat historic in its timing. And as you know, following that, we had the infamous shootout, the uh, Department of Justice investigation. It was a Mad which, Madeline Fletcher case. Correct, correct. Which uh, placed a national spotlight on the Flint Police Department and the need to develop innovative training. Yeah. And so I began to assist the late Dorothy McNeil, who at the time was the Flint Human Relations Director, in restructuring the City of Flint Police Academy to accommodate a previously excluded group. And on the Madison Fletcher case, for some of my listeners who might not remember it, was a case in which... Uh, uh, a police, a male, uh, uh, white uh, police officer in Madeline Fletcher, who was uh, African American, got into some kind of tiff, and and there was a shooting that took. I, I can't remember quite how it all went, but one of them, I want to say it was Madeline Fletcher, shot. Didn't she shoot the guy? Correct. Yeah, she shot her partner, and then of course that created that. She was wounded as well. Right. That's correct. And it caused, uh, in, in all in the context of uh, the 19th. Over who would drive the cruiser that morning. Yeah, it was kind of a crazy, crazy thing. But it certainly shined a lot of light on Flint and especially uh, uh, its police department and the state of race relations in, in not just the city, but, but uh, you know, we had this going on in the police department. It certainly didn't reflect well on how they were going to engage in police uh, policing the community. So Avon, that's impressive. I didn't realize that about you. So you, you then you were working with the, uh, with the uh, human uh, relations department at the city of Flint. And then what happened? And after that, I went over to Flint's first ombudsman office under uh, the late Joe Dupsa. Yeah. And of course, the uh, ombudsman was created by city charter to investigate uh, complaints pertaining to all aspects of city government. Yeah. And that too was a very challenging assignment at that particular time in my career. And from there, I took an educational leave and went to MSU, Michigan State, to pursue a master's in uh, criminal justice. And, uh, at, and you were at the Michigan State School of Criminal Justice, which is you know, nationally known as one of the better schools of criminal justice in, in, in our country. Um, did you, you finish there with both a, a, a PhD as well as a master's degree? No, just the master's. I, following graduation, I turned down a full-time position at Illinois State University to go to General Motors, where I anticipated actually becoming a uh, security chief, but I was just a bit ahead of my time. And so I worked some security loss prevention, did a year-long management training program, and um, in 1985, I quit General Motors, took a substantial pay cut to go to my community college to begin my career as the coordinator and professor. And you took over that position from uh, former Sheriff Joe Wilson. Correct. I was the third, at that time, I was the third coordinator of the program, the first being the Honorable James Rutherford followed by Dr. Joe Wilson, and then myself. And not only was I uh, the first female to take that position, <laughs> the first non-police person 
to take the position. And then um, first female, first female non-police. But it, again, an interesting time. When I took over the program, um, it had 250 students. And at the time that I retired, we were the second largest occupational program on campus. Great. We're going to get to so, that in just a second here. Let's uh, let's go backwards for a second because I want to get your education down here. Uh, I made a mistake on my slide and put PhD from Michigan State, but where was your PhD from? Wayne State University. Wayne State. Yes, I'm sorry about that on my slide. I'll have to try oh. to correct it. Um, no problem. And uh, you did that while you were still working at the college, then. Correct. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, in terms of other things you've done in the community um, outside of Mock College and so forth, you've been active in various community organizations. Um, yeah. And professional. I'm a, uh, I'm a past president of the Mock Community College Born Club. Yes. Which is I served on the Crime Stoppers Board of Directors and was editor of his newsletter. Uh-huh. And you were also you've been also involved in professional associations uh, dealing with criminal justice as well. Yeah, the uh, Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences was the primary professional organization of which I was um, affiliated. Academy. Mm -hmm. I was I was thinking. But I also want to share that uh, I was also on the Thumb Prison um, Correctional board and was appointed by the um, Honorable Governor Jennifer Granholm to the Corrections Officers Training Council, of which I ultimately served as chair. And that, that council essentially uh, oversees the standards and so on of those who work in Michigan's prisons. That's right. Yeah. Um, and and I, I mentioned with pride that the state of Michigan led the nation uh, with regard to educational standards for entry level state correctional officers. Yvonne, you, uh, one of the things that I think about when I think about your, your background is I never forget that you are the daughter of Henry Burns, a remarkable well, man who not long ago passed away uh, tell us a little bit about your dad. He He's something to talk about. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, my dad lived to be 97 years old. And he originated from the state of Mississippi. The, um, I see, about 10 children. His parents were farmers and landowners. But my dad left home at an early age, joined the CC camp eventually went into the United States Army, World War II. And from there, I found his way to Flint for a General Motors position and ultimately became involved in the UAW, United Auto Workers, Local 659. And I did ask my dad once what motivated him to uh, become involved with the union and if I recall correctly he said it was um, the fact that he wanted to improve conditions for the automotive workers. He ultimately received the Walter P. Ruther Distinguished Service Award because he was elected to the position of chairman of the shop committee longer than anyone in the history of local 659. So that position was a chief, the chief negotiator for the local contracts and I'm sure at times he got involved in national contracts with the UAW. Absolutely. Health care, health care, substance abuse, um, vacation pay, uh, workers pay, are just a few, you know, the areas in which I'm sure his ne negotiations took him. In fact, there's a photograph of him with the former president of the UAW, Walter P. Ruther, 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. So definitely, he was involved in some with some national negotiations. Yes, and he was also, for those that aren't familiar with the Flint area, the local 659 uh, uh, is a local that represents, um, you know, the engine plant in Flint and one of the more significant uh, locals in the nation uh, and one of the larger ones. Uh, of course, we had Buick, which was a little larger than that, but Henry Burns was a significant person in the history of Flint. And during a period of time that was not easy to be in union office because he uh, negotiated contracts with General Motors through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I met him as a young man um, coming here and, and learning how to practice law at the beginning. And uh, he took a liking to me. And little did I know, I'd eventually work for his daughter, uh, which was which was in my life uh, rather amazing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving along. Uh, you had a number of career accomplishments, and and I, you know, you're not one to toot your own horn, and, and for that matter, almost nobody that I've interviewed, they're all understated. Those with accomplishments, and uh, and you're certainly one of those people that uh, has had some significant accomplishments. And I'm just going to name a few of them for you. One, you organized the largest criminal justice fair in Michigan, uh, which was. Uh, which, which, uh, to me, uh, you were you were one of the people that actually found a way to link your students with uh, the workplace, and and it became so popular that people would come from other schools to sneak in on your career fair. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, this is true. Um, each year in April, in fact, I believe it was April fourth was um, the Criminal Justice Career Fair with over 40 uh, different criminal justice agencies and um, hundreds of people in attendance. And it was a wonderful opportunity for both the agencies to promote their various operations, their services, and to take a look at students who were in a position to be hired for various careers. And of course, it was an extraordinary opportunity for the students to be able to visually see the breadth of criminal justice opportunities, both traditional and non-traditional, that might eventually be available to them. And as a result, uh your students went across the nation to, to take jobs from Dallas, Texas, to the Alaska Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, to I don't know how many other places. Uh, but the United States Border Patrol, um, we have a student with a law degree down in uh, Georgia who chose uh, education as a path. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. I. Uh, went to the Yellow Pages. I still use the Yellow Pages. Well, I was at that time. I needed a window repaired. And um, I identified a person and he came to my home and he saw a photograph of me. He says, uh, are you Dr. Burns? I said, yes. And uh, he recounted that he had had me many, many years ago as a uh, incoming freshman at my community college. But Art, do you know that he could tell me excerpts of the very first lecture that he had wow. heard in my classroom? Wow, amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, because you've impacted uh, literally thousands and thousands of people's lives in, in very positive ways. Uh, many of your students are now police or police administrators, police chiefs. Uh, some may be even professors, and certainly you have a few lawyers thrown in there. I know at least uh, two of them I, that I can count right off the top of my head. I'm no telling how many others. Um, and the current undersheriff is also a product of our program. Yes, and, and the former undersheriff was, uh, in, was a, a professor in your program for many years, Art Evans. Mm -hmm. uh, Avon, yeah, we had an we had an extraordinary faculty in the criminal justice program at my community college, which really freed me up to coordinate 
You know, you keep calling me boss, but we definitely had an open concept where we had some of the best and brilliant minds of criminal justice all working together for a common goal to educate students. Exactly. And, you know, I was thinking last night uh, before I went to bed, uh, I was thinking about that because it was an amazing collection of talent that you were able to recruit. I mean, you essentially you recruited me. Uh, I had been teaching in, a, in another part of the college. And I was so inspired by what you were doing. And when I went over there, I realized, and last night I started counting and I ran out of counts, but uh, you recruited you recruited the police chief of Flint, the largest department in the county. You recruited the county prosecutor. You got the under sheriff. You had the sheriff. And between all those, these weren't just a bunch of, you know, hacks, people that weren't talented. First of all, they were they were at that point running the criminal justice system in one of the you know, most violent places in the United States and the number of degrees that these men had. I could I lost count men and women. I lost yes. count at ten just amongst those four of us. Uh that's and, right. And Joe Wilson probably accounted for half of those eleven. Uh, that's right. With his four or five I think he has five degrees. Uh but you had an extraordinarily talented faculty there. How did you do that? Well, not all the credit goes to me. The credit goes to uh, Dr. Joe Wilson, who really planted those seeds there. With him bringing me on was an extraordinary move. The first non-police person to teach criminal justice at my community college, not only at my community college, but, but maybe the state of Michigan. He was a visionary. So the seeds were planted. Um... And all I had to do was step in and continue the trend that had previously been set. But we, we brought a little bit more structure to the program. And of course, as we grew, uh, so did the faculty. In addition to those that you named, we had the warden from the Thumb Prison. We had the county administrator from Lapeer. Uh, we had a magistrate, we had a judge. Um, yeah, Judge Perry. Judge Perry was in there at one point. And yeah, Judge we had a community relations, police relations, community policing expert. It was just, it was just a great time. Uh, it was a great time, now, and I'm proud and honored to have been a part of this place in history. Now, your your program actually, for at least. Two of the uh, the college uh, employed some experts to come and measure the effectiveness of programs, you know, of the various programs within the college. And the Mott College's criminal justice program, which was graded on, I think, 120 or 30 different uh, measures, uh, turned out to rank uh, as one of the best, as one of the top top programs, one or two in the entire college. Uh, that's, that's correct. Based on yeah. student satisfaction, education of the faculty, uh, cost of delivery of services, effectiveness in terms of that, which all reflected on Avon Burns. Um, so, so now um, so you've done. You did, well, that's my dog in the background. He's doing a tap dance because he's got coronavirus problems because of the he can't get his toenails cut at the vet. <laughs> so he's he's a familiar he's a familiar entertainer on these podcasts but one of the things i wanted to say about what you have done you also um were involved in some really innovative uh programming at the college as well besides the career fair you also uh got students involved in national pre in presentations at the uh, National Organizations for Criminal Justice, which gave the kids a lot of exposure to the to the field of criminal justice. Tell us a little bit about that. I thought that was really unique. I'm really surprised you would remember that. But yeah, we founded a student organization under my watch called LEARN, which stood for Law Enforcement Resource Network. And um, 
we had um, shirts and um, we raised money and we were engaged in community service and those criminal justice students began to dominate uh, student government at my community college and assuming many of them becoming president of um, student government and so the leadership potential of the student organization was without question uh, yeah, very very high and yes the students traveled annually with me to the academy of criminal justice science conference which is the premier conference for criminal justice practitioners and educators in the country and those students began to deliver uh, professional presentations at um, the academy of criminal justice science conference and so the criminal justice student organization was another aspect of the program which also excelled at the time that we were in the business. Yeah, an amazing thing. Uh, Avon, uh, throughout your career, you've made a lot of friends. I'm showing a slide up here with some of the faculty and uh, a picture of your mentor, Joe Wilson. So I think he was one of your mentors along the place path. Uh, and every time I speak to you, and of course, since I retired and you retired uh, about the same time, uh, you asked me about a young lawyer named Matthew Norwood. Yes. You always uh -huh. ask me how he's doing. Why was he such a uh -huh. special? Why was he such a special student? Well, you know, I don't. I didn't actually teach um, Attorney Norwood. I believe I was introduced to him through Court Gregory. But but what's interesting is that his aunt taught me at Whittier. Ah, I see. I got the uh -huh. connection. Okay. But Attorney Norwood was just so personable and so sharp that um, I immediately wanted him involved with the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee, which he had graciously agreed to do. And he brought along another lawyer from uh, the federal court. Jeez, forgive me, but I can't think of his name right now. But they were very uh, influential and significant to the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee. And now, as we both know, Mr. Norwood is serving on the Mott Community College Board of Trustees. An amazing thing. Now, one of the things I mentioned, I didn't mention, and that was this criminal justice advisory board because uh, anybody that was anybody in the community justice uh, community or uh, criminal justice community throughout, not just Genesee County, but Lapeer and Chiawassee County as well, participated on your advisory committee. And I'm talking about the U.S. attorneys, uh, you name it, they were involved in this program. Yes, the FBI. Yes. Uh, and and so uh, that committee was as much a, a, a point of gathering to uh, to discuss issues and and share um, share things with our colleagues throughout the region, and became. A, I don't smile. I don't smile easily, but I have the biggest smile on my face. For that advisory committee, we were supposed to be limited, I think, to twelve members. And on average, at the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee meetings, we probably had close to 40 wow. members. Wow. And these, these professionals were consistently loyal to attending the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee meetings, serving as speakers for the meetings, supporting the criminal justice career fair, and probably, perhaps most importantly, hiring our students. Exactly, well, and, and ultimately impacting our community to, to increase the level of uh, professionalism in the field of criminal justice, uh, which is- so An interagency cooperation 
and appreciation. Oh, no question about it. Um, so Avon, uh, uh, I want to come back to that in a few seconds here. Um, one of the things that happened during your tenure was Smock Community College and Ferris State University entered into uh, an agreement to, uh, on, um, I think you call it a matric, you, got, you academics got a lot of words that I have to have to kind of figure out which one is a, matric, a matriculation agreement so that somebody can go to my college and take Ferris classes and get a BA uh, all at the same time. At a, at a less price. All, it, all in the same building without leaving the campus of my community college. Yeah. And how Our graduation, the my community college criminal justice graduation rate was significant enough that it caught the attention of Ferris State University and the past director of Ferris State University criminal justice and myself, we sat down and we talked about the potential for this articulation agreement, which would accept every credit from the Mont College Criminal Justice Program, where those students could simply go downstairs in the same building and earn a Bachelor of Science degree from Ferris State University in criminal justice. Yes. That is yet another example of the significant accomplishments that we experienced as the Mont Community College Criminal Justice Program. And I say we because I have never operated as um, someone who did not understand the necessity and the value of teamwork. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Avon, uh, we're running short of time, but I want to talk to you about a couple issues, uh, some of which are, uh, we, um, one of the things that uh, uh, Flint, in many respects, has been a progressive city in criminal justice in many ways. Uh, sometimes that's overlooked, um, and we can go back and talk about all kinds of stories. Uh, we, you know, we had community policing, and, and on that criminal justice advisory committee, uh, Mr. Ben Benson was on there, uh, who was quite right. quite uh, Bruce Benson, who later became the uh, head of public safety at Michigan State University, and was uh, was quite influential in the uh, community policing uh, concept throughout America. Uh, we also had a former prosecutor way back in the '60s. Uh, Robert Leonard, who was also seen as being very uh, progressive in, in uh, race relations, particularly. And we've moved on to an era uh, where uh, we've had a number of incidents throughout the country uh, which uh, involve, uh, uh, you know, police uh, involved shootings uh, where lots of questions have been raised and and uh, it, it spawned uh, you know, national outrage at uh, some of the investigations that went on of these police officers and how the shootings occurred and whether it was proper use of force. But, but, but at the bottom line of it all, um, it spawned various organizations like Black Lives Matter and so forth. I, I would like your assessment of how Flint, Michigan stacks up at this time and what kinds of things might be necessary to move us forward as a team. I like that idea, and that seems to be one of the things we lack yeah. at, at this moment in history. I know something I that's worry, right, that's something right. Something I uh, let me say that those um, horrible incidents of um, police shootings where um, many have lost their lives uh, is not only um, saddening, but uh, deeply troubling and no doubt is um, a result of where we're at today um, at this point at this time in history to move I think in a, pos a more positive direction locally 
I think it would be wonderful to to bring together some of the the great minds of the past who have um, gone through the trenches, so to speak, with regard to the birth of some of the more progressive and positive uh, policies that impacted criminal justice. Uh, rather than um, shutting us out, so to speak, why not invite us in to share a perspective at the table? And maybe this could be the beginning of the, the rebirth of some promising ideas to uh, improve our community. Excellent idea. And Radio Free Flint, the project that I initiated, uh, has uh, within the next few weeks, we'll launch uh, a justice uh, section uh, so that we can do just just that. And I wouldn't mind inviting you back because uh, you've given me some good ideas. And one of them is maybe we could have uh, an on, uh, you know, since we're all sitting at home, uh, <laughs> at least for another another few weeks, maybe we could gather some of those great minds to talk uh, on a, on a, on a, conf a video conference uh, to do so. Avon, we have to run, but I want to give you an opportunity. You've had so much uh, influence on people's lives throughout this region, uh, in the police community particularly, but in other, other areas as well. Um, you know, Flint is, is facing um, enormous challenge right now, both economically and then its public health. Um, what is it about this place that, um, what is it about Flint that is, has allowed it to survive s so many big storms? What do you, what, what do you think it is? Well, that's an interesting question. I think Flint um, I think it's, we stand on its history. We stand on its history of um, many, many, many people who migrated here, who came from hardworking backgrounds. And it, I think Flint continues to hold that, um, that benevolent spirit of, of caring for one another. I mean, you look at TV and you see the food lines in other cities where people are standing in line for food. Uh, and, and I don't think that happens here. I, I truly believe if there are people who need food, that we have the programs and services that they could access. Now, I might be naive on that. What do you think? Well, there's certainly a spirit of giving, uh, and 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 there's a spirit of helping. Uh, uh -huh. And then underlying all that, there's there's people who have seen a lot of life in this town, and a lot of that has to do with you know dealing with uh, crime problems, dealing with unemployment, the give and take of the automobile industry. I agree with you about the uh, the spirit and of of hard work. And the ethics of the of the uh, of the middle class uh, that you know essentially powered this place to be one of the uh, our, at one point the arsenal of democracy it was called. Uh, so I think you're right there, uh, but I think what's lacking and what maybe uh, you've touched on, and that is we've lost a, a sense of teamwork. You know, you, you refer back to to Mr. Bogan, who who at one time ran the city of Flint. He he had enough vision to see that it took you know it took a lot of people rowing the boat in the same direction and uh -huh. some progress. So uh -huh. if, if people can't get past their their parochial and petty uh, selves uh, to see. Unfortunately. The, yeah, to see the big picture. Uh, the city's there there's, seems to be a lot of jealousy and resentment at this time rather than appreciation for yeah. what uh, one can bring to the table. Well, we live in an era where finger pointings become popular and uh, and progress uh, sometimes isn't as, as much of a value. Uh, but I think ultimately you've got the solution and that is uh, none of these problems can be solved by one person or one group of people, it has to come from a, a total team effort. 
Avon Burns, it's been delightful talking to you again. And uh, I, uh, I am so happy that you chose to uh, uh, appear on my show, the fledgling podcast that it is. And um, I hope that you'll take time to come back again. And to our listeners, uh, those of you that are interested in criminal justice, we still have a criminal justice program at Mock Community College. We still have a great program at Michigan State University. And uh, we have made a lot of progress in our community because we relied on those institutions to help us find the best police officers and the best criminal justice professionals in America. So with that, I think Avon will agree with me on this. That is, we, we need to stay put in our homes for just a little while longer. Uh, hopefully this uh, will pass and we'll be able to get out and mingle again. Um, and so for the moment, stay home, please. If you like this podcast, uh, you can subscribe to it on the various uh, podcasting applications, Apple uh, Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. We're there. We also have a Facebook page, Radio Free Flint. You can watch videos, including this one eventually. And we wish you all a good day. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our show. Goodbye. Okay, good morning. This is uh, Radio Free Flint, Arthur Bush speaking. We have a, a really good show today. We have Avon Burns, who's a, a retired professor and coordinator of the criminal justice program at Mock Community College, and she's going to talk to us. Uh, this is a lady that's the, the, maybe not the mother of all the police that you see out there and the police leaders, but she certainly contributed to their careers here in uh, the Flint area and further out. So, uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, her uh, her pre her uh, biography a little bit and uh, her accomplishments at Mock Community College, which in my mind uh, are un uh, in my mind at least they're uh, things which our community needs to to understand and copy in other areas of uh, a life of excellence because Avon Burns represents the best that Flint, Michigan can produce. Now with that great introduction, Avon, uh, tell us all about yourself. 